We all know about those corny ghost hunting shows, right? You know, those shows that don't trust you to feel your own emotions and have to try to constantly dictate to you how you're feeling. Now you're feeling tense and uneasy. Oh, don't believe me? Well, this random, creepy, and kind of off-putting music that we've just overlaid onto this questionable scene says otherwise. Don't be stupid. People can't feel emotions on their own. Well, how else would the viewer feel ever so slightly scared when watching their 15th episode in a row and they do the old, what was that over there, trick? I don't know what that was over there. Because somehow, every time something of note ever happens in one of these shows, the camera seems to be pointed anywhere except actually over there where the thing is happening. We all know those shows, right? Flicking through the channels late one night, filtering through all of the uninspired, generic drivel that one might find at that time of night, until you find a very specific type of uninspired, generic drivel. Ghost hunting. And in the UK, we've got a show called Most Haunted. A show about a group of people visiting, well, places that are the most haunted. They walk around trying to communicate with spirits and other things they probably shouldn't be trying to communicate with. Didn't you watch The Mummy? Leave the dead alone, bro. Unless you've got Brendan Fraser with you, then by all means, defile those resting places to your heart's content. But if not, don't do that. They spend the night there, usually in the pitch black because apparently ghosts have an aversion to light, which I have a hard time believing on account of them being dead. <laughs> I can't see myself giving much of a shit if I'm dead, to be honest. And they use various different pieces of paranormal detection equipment, as well as the help of psychics, who have absolutely proven themselves to be incredibly trustworthy people and definitely legit. Not to say that all psychics are full of it, it's not exactly something that I'm an expert on myself, considering I'm an expert at not literally being an expert at anything. But chances are, if they're on TV, or if money is involved, well let's just say you don't require a psychic to understand their true motives. <laughs> A big thank you to Kamikoto Knives for sponsoring today's video. Not ideal for ghost hunting, in fact Kamikoto really wants me to tell you that they're not liable for any ghost hunting related mishaps that happens with their products. After a long hard night of strenuous ghost hunting, consisting of standing in a pitch black room and repeatedly saying, did you hear that? You're bound to be hungry and keen for something nice to eat. Well, Kamikoto Knives makes great Japanese steel kitchen knives, where over 800 years of Japanese technology and expertise has gone into creating the steel that the knives have been meticulously handcrafted from using techniques that date all the way back to the Edo period of Japan. So not only can you slice through any ingredient with ease after a long hard night of ghost hunting, but you can look cool as heck while doing it. They're made with high quality Japanese steel sourced from mills across Japan and each knife comes in a beautiful heavy duty ash wood box that makes sure the knife is stored safely but also makes Kamikoto serve as a great gift. There's a variety of knives to choose from depending on what you're after. The three piece Kanpeki knife set that comes with the Nakiri vegetable knife, the slicing knife and the utility knife with there being many others to choose from like the Kamikoto Santoku blade. All of the blades have a satin finish for a subtle yet stunning luster. Each Kamikoto knife goes through a rigorous 19 step process that takes several years from start to finish to complete and their single bevel edge Kamikoto knives can achieve an unbelievably sharp edge that you just can't get with other knives. Go to kamikoto.com slash bigwill and use the discount code bigwill to get $50 off on top of Kamikoto's already big sale. Get some cool knives, save some money, support the channel, and flex on some ghosts. Just remember, don't be walking around with these in pitch black rooms while disturbing some kind of ancient spirit. They really will make a reality TV show just about anything these days, won't they? People being famous for simply existing, children being exploited for weirdos to watch on stage, naked people smashing rocks in the woods, Ozzy Osbourne for some reason, okay that one was kind of cool actually, and people harassing the dead. And if you've seen any of these ghost investigation shows before, well you've seen Most Haunted before. I tracked down perhaps one of the most infamous episodes of Most Haunted, mainly for one moment in particular which we'll talk about later, and trust me you'll want to stick around for that, and definitely not just because the YouTube algorithm really likes it when you do that. God, I'm a slave to the machine. It opens with an immediate scream and multiple different shots of people freaking out to really set the mood. That mood being, the show really wants you to be scared, like please be scared. This episode takes place at Bodmin Jail, a prison in England that was built back in 1779. To get a feeling for how old that is, that's only three years after the Declaration of Independence was signed and the United States was formed. So basically, almost as old as your mum. We're getting an introduction to the premises, with the presenter cross dissolving into frame in a classic early to mid 2000s fashion because reverse Thanos snapping was the hip way to enter rooms back then. 
She's talking about different reports that people have made about the so-called paranormal activity in the area, the usuals like hearing things and seeing things, but then she goes on to say, Also the feeling of utter depression has been experienced. Yes, yes it has been experienced, literally everywhere. I don't think you can put that one down to ghosts, unless everybody who suffers from depression has their own little depression ghost following them around and going, feel bad, don't feel good things, how dare you be happy. We meet the two psychics, Derek and David, the double Ds, with it almost immediately cutting to Derek just having a full-blown conversation with a spirit. I mean, supposedly having a full-blown conversation with a spirit. He could just be faking it and having a nice little chit-chat to himself, but no one would lie about something like that. Surely not. Interestingly, he is able to give information that could be verified as truth, like names and dates of deaths, but it's just the manner in which he retrieves said information. He talks to the spirit as if it's a toddler. He lost his life, did he, Sam? What, what did he do? He murdered. He was a murderer. Derek, the poor fucker's dead, not slow in the brain. To be fair, I'd start doing poltergeist shit too if some dude showed up to my resting place and started talking to me as if I'm ready for my nap time. I'm already taking the eternal nap. There's an awful lot of hearing some kind of movement that just happens to conveniently be off camera in a premises that is absolutely full of crew holding cameras. Nobody ever happens to be looking in the direction where the things occur, which is a common theme that all of these ghost shows seem to have in common. It's as if all the ghosts from all across the world came to their annual ghost meetup and decided that as a collective, that in no uncertain terms, under no circumstances whatsoever, must a spirit do spooky shit in front of a camera. It makes you wonder, right? Out of all of these ghost hunting shows that exist, and all of the episodes and investigations that each of these shows have done, no matter what crazy and unexplainable events may unfold, there's still been nothing proven. And I'm not even after like 100% concrete proof the more I think about it. It's just that you can only hear so many bangs in the distance before you say, okay, I'm done with hearing bangs in the distance. Is that all they can do? Do they need to acquire more XP to unlock abilities or something? Are they just grinding out their door knocking abilities? Well, apparently one of them has gained the ability of possession as Derek just starts walking around angrily spouting off words and punching things. Surprisingly, the crew is not alarmed whatsoever. In fact, this must be somewhat of a regular occurrence for Derek, because one of the crew members simply walk over to him and give him a big hug. Aww. Oh, our psychic's been possessed by this angry spirit who we've been told is incredibly agitated and violent. Better give him a hug. Don't worry, ancient demonic malevolent being. Everything will be fine. For a show whose entire purpose is about finding proof of the supernatural and life beyond death, they don't seem to care all that much about the whole demonic possession thing that's just occurred. I don't know, you'd think in this kind of industry that sort of thing would be somewhat of a big deal? Well, Derek clearly feels the same way too, and is not satisfied with the crew's reaction of the possession, and sometime later decides to give it another go. That, or Derek just really likes to be hugged, because that seems to be the only thing that happens when he starts going around shouting at things and punching things. I want to know what made them come to the conclusion that hugging a possessed person was the right course of action here, because movies would have us believe that the right course of action is to usually tie them down and perform some sort of exorcism with a priest. But maybe this is the quick and easy way of performing an exorcism that the church don't want you finding out about. Priests hate him. See this one simple trick to avoid paying for an exorcism. It does beg the question though, how was something like this discovered? It reminds me of another question that I've been pondering about for many years. How did the first person realize that you could actually milk a cow? What the fuck was up with that dude? Animal molestation aside and back to the topic at hand, they always do this thing, which is common across all paranormal investigation shows, where they take a completely normal and totally rationally explainable situation and blag it into something far more scary than it actually is. They might hear a door way off in the distance make a creaking noise and then proceed to say something along the lines of There's absolutely no doors in this area. How could a door possibly make a noise here? That doesn't make any sense. Totally forgetting or conveniently omitting the fact that they're usually in some kind of incredibly large old structure that are known to make noises simply due to the age and the materials used to build them without forgetting that there's usually plenty of ways for outside animals and wind to enter the building. Things start to get really interesting when they decide to bring out the big guns. A glass cup. We've all seen it in horror movies, we've all seen it in trash TV, we know what they're about to do with it. They all place their fingers on it, and miraculously, as soon as they start to ask it questions, the glass begins to move. Which totally has nothing to do with the fact that half of the crew members have their fingers on it and anybody could be moving it. <laughs> That's absurd. So they freak out in the slightest noise that they hear in this building, but when their supposed psychic becomes possessed and the glass apparently begins to move all on its own, nobody seems to give a shit. 
Huh, interesting that. And saying that, isn't it incredibly convenient that in the few hours that they've been here, they've heard noises, had a possession, and watched a glass move on its own? Well, I'm not saying that it's fake, but what I am saying is that's one hell of a coincidence that would certainly make for good TV. And I think the producers thought that too. At least at the end of the episode, once the sun comes out and all of the spooky factor is gone. They do acknowledge that any of the noises could have just been environmental, and Derek's possession should be taken with some scepticism. We have to treat his possession with some sort of scepticism. Some scepticism is rather an interesting way to put it, because the whole possession thing was discovered to be completely bullshit. What? Who'd have possibly known? It would later be revealed that Derek faked the entire thing, resulting in him being asked to leave the show, as the person he claimed to be possessed by was just a made-up fake name that someone had written down and placed near him, and he fell hook, line, and sinker for it. Great! And you'd think that after being caught out in something like that, you'd perhaps not be so ballsy with your fakery for a while, probably tone it down until everybody sort of forgets about it. Nope. The exact same thing happened in the next episode, as he claimed to communicate with a spirit who was made up by one of the crew members. So the creators of the show genuinely believe that everything they experience is real, and that's why they fired him, because of the one and only fake part of a show that everybody already knows is fake. Precious. You think TV is real? Dude, the news isn't even real anymore. Anyway, Most Haunted is the show that I'm most familiar with, so I wanted to see if they do it any differently across the pond. And when it comes to American ghost hunting shows, well, there's a lot to choose from, but I ultimately ended up settling on Ghost Hunters, for no other reason than it started not long after Most Haunted became a thing. Like I did with the UK show, I wanted to choose an episode of somewhat relevancy, because there's nothing quite like being exposed as a fraud on TV and then doing the exact same thing on the next episode. And to find the information, I typed into Google the best Ghost Hunters episodes, clicked a Screen Rant article, and immediately scrolled all the way down to the number one entry without reading a single word, because we like to do things professionally around here. And right from the get-go, it's essentially the exact same formula. A bunch of people go to some spooky old place, somehow manage to capture barely anything of note on camera, and use devices to detect or communicate with the dead, because it's common knowledge that spirits like to communicate using Fisher-Price toddler phones. But because it's American, of course it's bigger and better. Get those those tiny ass McDonald's cups out of here, we're drinking from a reservoir, son. In this episode, the group are investigating what they call a lunatic asylum, which they've covered in the past. But maybe calling it a lunatic asylum might just be a bit offensive for the ghosts? Being here at Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, you've got to be prepared for anything. Perhaps something a little more subtle, like psychiatric hospital? Oh. You're a woman in the 1800s with opinions and thoughts, you lunatic. From the very start, I've already got high expectations about the episode. As they said last time they were here, they witnessed people being pulled away and dragged into rooms by ghosts. But here's a thought. Perhaps if you didn't go around calling them lunatics, then maybe they wouldn't go around dragging you in rooms. In dealing with lunatics... And for some reason, the common rule across all of these ghost hunting shows is the lights need to be turned off. Okay, in Most Haunted, that place was a literal prison in ruins, but I'm pretty sure that this is an actively maintained building. We see it clearly has electricity. What, a ghost scared of the light or something? This show also does this rather deceptive thing of adding sound effects and ominous music to the background. So what the hell's going on in there? An argument could be made that they're included to enhance the viewer's experience, but let's be real, they're included into tricking the viewer into fight or flight mode, making them think that there's actually something to be scared of. But in actual fact, it's just a couple of bros in a pitch black room talking to themselves. It'd be far more interesting and actually believable if they left all of that stuff out. It just takes away from the real nature of the show and just makes me feel like I'm watching The Conjuring or something. The Conjuring already exists. If I wanted to watch that, then I'd go watch that. And apparently this show doesn't know about the thing called pacing, because it wastes absolutely no time with building up tension or anything like that. Things just immediately begin to happen, with one of the crew claiming that they can feel someone pulling on their shoulder as they try to read patient records. I felt like something tugged on my shoulder. Yeah, no shit they don't want you reading those. Patient records are supposed to be confidential. Alive or dead? I think I'd have a bit of a problem with some dude strolling into my hospital. Oh, sorry. Lunatic Asylum. Digging through my records and finding my extensive history of extremely large hemorrhoids. Ooh. The show wastes absolutely no time when it comes to showing you the fake stuff. Oh, I mean, uh, good stuff. As soon as they put down a movement sensor and ask a ghost to trigger it, the sensor gets triggered. Is your name Jane? Oh my god. Wow, that was pretty wild. I guess the ghost is a people pleaser. They use the sensor to communicate with the spirit. They have the spirit set it off to answer a yes-no question before proceeding to just have a full-blown interview with a ghost. 
Yeah, they're interviewing ghosts now, I guess. Step aside, Vanity Fair. It's Ghost Hunter's time to shine. I guess that it's just an average day at the office for these guys, but their reaction to communicating with the dead, something that has already passed on and possesses no physical being whatsoever, is about the same reaction that they would have as if their boss walked into the office and gave the old, we really appreciate our employees and all their hard work speech, two days after a large group of layoffs and a pay cut. I'm under absolutely no illusion that this is real, but at least try. The exact same thing happens with another group in a different part of the building, as they're using some kind of high-tech ghost hunting gizmo that just happens to miraculously work first time as soon as they start asking questions. It's not a coincidence either. Literally every time they attempt to interact with a ghost in the show, without fail, something will happen. These ghosts really love the spotlight, huh? That sort of behavior essentially translates to the entirety of the show and everything they end up doing. Like either they're really good at coaxing out spirits, or the producers are getting a little overzealous with the distant doorknob rattling. So... So... Anything that one of the crew might see somehow never manages to be captured on camera. They're all walking around with their own personal cameramen who's following them and filming everything that they're doing. But as soon as Mr. Ghostman happens to look over here, that's when all of the crazy stuff starts to happen. If we're lucky, we might get to see a little orb floating across a doorway or something. But is that a paranormal orb or is that a piece of dust or flake of paint falling from the ceiling of a couple hundred year old building? You tell me. Or how they always jump to these massive conclusions the size of your mum. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I had to fit another your mum joke in here. I'm sure she's really sweet, she's probably a really lovely lady. She'll probably really like me. They always do. They feel the need to have their audio gain dialed up to 11, to the point where you'd be lucky to hear a faint fart from one of the hosts amongst all of the static, and then proceed to say things like, we just heard what sounds like a little girl's voice. Yeah, sure, if this little girl happens to sound like tinfoil being crumpled up. Okay, yeah, you can hear it. And at one point, I'm not even joking, they just straight up decide to start taunting the ghosts. One of them starts walking around and asking, Are you ready for your therapy? A little lobotomy for you? While simultaneously clanging the very bone chisels together that were used to perform hundreds of lobotomies in this facility? Sure. Why not start pissing off the tormented souls who are doomed to spend eternity within these walls? He's straight up asking to be yanked into a room by one of these ghosts. Like, if these guys are real and actually true professionals and believe in everything they're doing, how insensitive have you got to be to do something like that? Time for your lobotomy. Does that sound make you nervous? That, amongst clips of daring someone to sniff a bedpan and eat a dead bug for quality TV entertainment, it's basically the same as Most Haunted, but bigger. But they do have this segment at the end where they review all of their evidence. And by review the evidence, I mean they basically just give the exact same commentary that they did at the time. However, there is this one piece of footage that appears to show a piece of paper moving on its own that just happens to be shot in about 144p quality at 2 frames per second, making it incredibly easy to dodge. Doctor, while also happening to be in a large open room that I wouldn't be surprised to learn had I drafted it. I don't know man, evidence of a ghost, or evidence that someone cracked a version of Adobe After Effects and started doing a bit of tinkering. But really, when it comes down to these shows, what they are is just a bit of popcorn entertainment. I don't know if ghosts are real, they might be, I don't know, I'm not one I couldn't say, but I don't think that these shows are very real. But I do know that these shows are very entertaining. Treat! but at the very least, extremely hammed up to be an entertaining watch. But it's TV, so of course it is. If you're a ghost, please don't be offended by the things that I've said. And despite everything I've said about these shows in this video, I still did want to carry on watching the next episodes, because clearly the formula works, and I like to watch a bunch of people walk around in the pitch black talking to nobody. What can I say? I'm easily impressed. It's the type of thing that absolutely terrified me as a kid, but entertains me as an adult. And that's really the best way to describe these shows, to be honest. Before we finish things up, I just wanted to give a reminder that my clothing brand Morbid Minds is now live. If you like any of the things you see on screen now, make sure you head to the website in the description to cop yourself a nice hoodie or t-shirt. Do it or the ghosts will come for you. And make sure you check out all my usuals like my Twitter or Instagram. Please, I need to be validated. And before we wrap things up, I'd like to give a big thank you to my patrons. Thank you to Dom, Hunters263, Rebecca Pitts, A Dandy in Space, Martin Brannan, Natasha Twyman, Rin and Whiskey, Jarrett CBs, Nicholas, Pascal Mathis, Fighting the Pirates, Richard McGowan III, Macy J, Reese Harford, Horatio, Jamie Thompson, Ramey Patterson, Chris, Michelle, Newcomb, Dennis, Wade Knott, Ike, Mr. J2, Monopogy, Ashley L. Wintz, Austin Wyport, and Christopher Butsky. Thank you so much to my patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.